All right, nine o'clock, we'll get started. My name is Samantha Contrini, and I'm the moderator for this session on behalf of Makuho. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. I hope you don't call yourself an ally with Amanda Slichter. Um, after the, the program, we will do an evaluation. Um, I will send out the link and the QR code for those of you, if you have time, it's like five minutes, please submit it. It's, it's great feedback for our presenter. Um, Additionally, uh, at the bottom of the screen, if you might need captions or you're just interested, you're not really sure what's being said, um, there's a button that says live transcript. If you click that and then choose view full transcript in your chat box, you'll be able to see a complete workup of everything being said as it's being said. And without further ado, please welcome Amanda Slipter. Good morning. How is everyone? Are we good? Yeah, I'm seeing smiles and waves and thumbs up. I love it. Um, I've been up since like one o'clock, so I'm wide awake. So we love it. Um, haven't had caffeine. I know it seems like it, but I hope you come along for the ride and have some fun with this. Uh, so I'm Amanda Slichter. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I'm an assistant director of residence life at Kutztown University. I just started there the July before this past July. So like a little over a year, maybe like a year and a half now. I don't know, something like that. Math is really hard for me. Um, let's see, what else? I'm the director of technology initiatives also for Makuho. So I'm happy to be here with my family. And uh, let's see what else. With presentations like this, I always like to go over my identities a little bit. I think that's super important, especially if you're talking about identities that you don't hold yourself. You need to disclose that so people know the lens that you're coming to this from. So I identify as a white, bisexual, cisgender woman. Um, so this is a presentation about how to act in solidarity with a variety of identities. So in some ways this may be being in solidarity with me, in some ways it's being in solidarity with a whole host of identities. Um, so I hope you get something out of this. And this is super informal. So if at any point you have questions, um, if you're able to unmute yourself or put a hand up or something, um, feel free to cut me off, interrupt me and we can chat. Sounds good, ready to go? Okay. Oops, I already messed up. We're gonna go back, there we go. Okay, so I hope you're not an ally, but I hope you act by aiming for allyship. So a little disclaimer on this title, I have a problem with the word ally. I don't think they exist. Um, I think that people should try to aim for allyship, but I think it's an unattainable goal because we're all inherently flawed and living in a system that has inundated us our entire lifetime with racism, homophobic, homophobic tendencies and sexism and classism and ableism and all of that. So we all have that in us and we're never gonna quite get there, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Um, so that's kind of my point here. And there's three principles that I thought about when making this presentation that are gonna guide us. So one, if you don't start with yourself, you'll fail. Um, I think we see this a lot in social justice work or higher education, residence life. I love that we talk about these things, but sometimes people are so caught up in these things and they think they're so woke that they're so busy like pointing out everything else everyone else is doing that's like racist or problematic. And they're not looking within themselves to question how are they contributing to those systems of power? When are they staying silent? What are they doing or saying that's per um, perpetuating all of these norms? So you need to start with yourself and really stop being defensive and start learning and doing better. Two, if it isn't hard, you're failing. This should be very difficult, right? This should be stressful. I mean, you should challenge yourself. And we all have our different lanes and ways of advocacy that are more comfortable for us. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those. Those are great. If um, sharing um, timely things or really helpful tools, educational tools on social media is easy for you, and that feels right and like a good lane for you to be in with your allyship, um, then do that. That's great. That's helpful for people who follow you, right? But also do the things that challenge you and speak up when the family member says something racist at Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. It needs to be hard um, if you're trying to really do better and be less terrible. <laughs> I know this is like gloom and doom to start, but I swear it gets better. Um, I just think sometimes we need a little bit of a, a wake up call here, especially at 9 a.m., right? And the last piece is the second you've arrived, you failed. This is another reason why I don't believe in allies because say that you're some like really super impressive robot 
and you've learned everything there is to learn about every identity and you're super woke, super inclusive, you never say or do the wrong thing, in like five minutes, it's gonna change. Um, Cause everything is constantly changing. It's something that you would have said or done 10 years ago is not an acceptable term or an acceptable thing to say or do anymore. So you need to keep learning and keep inundating yourself with new experiences and new information. Um, so that's kind of the gist of where this title comes from. I know it's like a little off-putting at first and people are like, what? Um, but this is where I'm coming from. So I hope that's helpful. All right. So next, what we're going to learn. So I hope that as a result of attending this session, you will be able to name at least two examples of problematic allyship. So something that's not actually allyship and then describe at least one way that you can use your privilege to act in solidarity. I want us to come away with tangible action items and making commitments um, to the communities around us. But before we learn, we always make some group agreements. Uh, so these are the ones that I usually um, use when I'm speaking, but I'll admit that these are the ones that I'm comfortable with. So if the group has anything they want to add into the chat or unmute themselves and suggest, that's totally cool. Um, but to go through these quickly, um, I think many of these we're familiar with. Uh, stay engaged. I would say whatever that looks like for you. I think this can be misleading because that can look different for different people. So if you need to practice self-care and um, walk away for a minute, shut off your camera, you do you. Um, but as much as you're able to engage and participate, that's how you're going to get the most out of it. Um, be afraid or don't be afraid to make mistakes, right? Like now, as I always tell my staff, like now is the time to screw up. Like if you're in training, if you're in a learning opportunity, it's better that you say or do the wrong thing here than when interacting with like a colleague, student, fellow human in like real life scenario. Experience discomfort. So that's a little bit of what I just said about stepping up and learning and putting yourself out there. Speak your truth. Um, so I statements, specifically what I mean by that is don't speak for an entire identity group or other people. Um, so you're not going to want to say something like, as white people, we, or as um, a bisexual woman, I, or you want to say that, you want to say I, you don't want to say we or speak for an entire identity or group. And also, oops and ouch. So if someone does say something, um, this is a space where you can expect to be corrected um, gently and nicely, but we will correct you if you say something that's inappropriate or we could learn from. And if something offends you, you could say, ouch, like that hurt. And we can talk about that and pause and have a moment to unpack that. Or oops, if you said something and you're like, oh, I know that totally came out wrong. Just say oops and we'll unpack it. Accept and expect non-closure. I think this is hard for a lot of people. We're not gonna solve racism, sexism, classism, ableism, et cetera, in the next 40 minutes. Sorry, it's not gonna happen. So expect that. And there may also be points where we don't agree with each other and that's okay too. Stories stay, lessons leave. I think this is probably the most important thing. If we're going to do these four things above, we need to trust that we're all doing the fifth thing. So specific names, scenarios will not leave those specific stories, but what you learn from what we share with each other should leave and you should carry that with you. So if I can just get like a thumbs up or some sort of signal from people that these are all good. Okay, from the faces I can see, it looks good. Alex, are you good? Good, okay. <laughs> um, good, I see it. All right, um, let's see. Anyone have anything to add that would make them more comfortable to participate today? All right, I think I have the all clear. Okay, so this is a quote that really got me thinking about this and how the title of Ally is problematic. So this says here, Ernest Owen said in this opinion piece of why I'm giving up on allies, generally such helpers can be assumed to be assisting with a problem they didn't create. Unfortunately, this isn't the case when it comes to social issues. In society, the benefits enjoyed by the privileged come at the expense of the marginalized. Accordingly, allies are in fact trying to clean up a mess that they are at least in part implicated in. Allyship creates a false quantification of deeds rather than self-reflection and on intention and approach. It means nothing to attend an advocacy rally or make a charitable donation if you still haven't come to terms with your privilege. I read that and I was like, oh, <laughs> that one like kicked me right in the gut. Um, so this just really stuck with me and got me thinking. I think there's another good analogy in this article or maybe I'm miscrediting and I read it somewhere else, but the analogy is that 
if someone bust into your bedroom and like made a huge mess and then was like, I'm going to help you clean this up. No, like you made the mess. <laughs> you're responsible for cleaning it up, right? So people from your identity, if you're from um, a group that hasn't been historically marginalized, if you're from a group that has privilege and power with your identity, this is on you to work to clean this up. So, uh, like I said, I have a problem with the term ally because I think that's unattainable and not realistic. But I think working towards allyship and uh, practicing allyship is a less problematic concept if used properly in this way. Um, so full disclosure, um, this statement was made um, alongside, so I used to work at Lehigh University and I did some part-time work in the Pride Center there. And the director and I came up with uh, this allyship statement and I just think it's a good reminder of what this work is actually supposed to be. Uh, so allyship is an active lifelong commitment to showing up for and advocating alongside historically marginalized communities. By leveraging power and privilege, you must practice ongoing learning, embrace challenges and own your mistakes in order to create a just equitable world for all. So when we look at this statement, what stands out for people? So now's the part where you talk to me and it's not awkward because people share. Um, so there's parts bolded here as like a little hint, but if you can tell me what makes this allyship statement productive or do you see any flaws within it? Because I think being critical is also important. Uh, hi, Amanda and everyone. Alex Werenberg, he is. Uh, I haven't looked deeply enough to properly, you know, critique yet, but um, I know that I've talked about this a bunch and I know that you and I have talked about it, Amanda, about allyship being like a verb, not a noun. And it's the things that you do. It's not just some title that you can put upon yourself. Um, and I, I'm sure you'll talk about it again, but I know we talked about it yesterday, how it feels like just it's unattainable to I'm, I'm an ally. I've completed all of my work. I've done what I did. No, it's an ongoing process, right? So I, I just looking at this alone, this allyship statement, it's like, yeah, this is exactly what people who call themselves allies, myself included, just need to realize that it, it's not, oh, I'm, I'm done. I've completed it. Here's my medal. You know, it's, it's actually an ongoing process forever and ever and ever until, and, until we tear down the system I don't, I don't even and then and then more and then there's more after that who knows awesome thanks alex anyone else for things that stand out i think you unmuted yourself ryan yeah um sorry one of the things that um i know we've talked about a lot in our department in these types of conversations as well is around the marginalized group being able to acknowledge and kind of say that you're an ally because I could say, oh, I'm an ally for black and brown people. But if they don't see my actions and articulate that the things that I'm doing are supportive of them, it doesn't mean anything. So there is some level of that um, advocacy um, that you're that group you're advocating for, like having that same type of like understanding of the actions that you're doing, because I can just say, hey, I'm an ally, but it doesn't mean anything if that group doesn't feel it either. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that you brought that up because I've been struggling with that myself. Like, well, what if this term is okay if someone from that group, that identity group bestows it upon you? And I've been really struggling with that because I still feel like a little eh about like buying into that because, you know, one people or a group of people speaking for an entire identity. Um, but at the same time, I think it's a good point to make that that is a heck of a lot better than what Alex shared about like, oh yeah, I'm an ally, I do this. and. Um, I think it's important that, you know, if you do have that, you know, someone sharing that with you, that you're an ally to them, just keep in mind that that, do that doesn't mean that you're infallible still, right? Like, you're going to still mess up and you're still going to say or do the wrong thing, but you've created a relationship where it's a safe space to learn and do better. So thank you. That's a really good point, Ryan. Anyone else about this before we move on? I like that it's really fluid and that just really owns up to you know, 30 years ago, tolerate was a positive word, right? For those of you that, that I've then, not to joke about it, but, you know, it's just, we have to keep educating ourselves. And for those of us, uh, I'll claim my own, my own process, you know, of being surprised about a few terms I had no idea were really out the window at the last couple of years, especially around black and brown people. I'm like, wow, okay, I really need to up my game of being aware and um, not that I've thought of this process as a check, check, check. You know, I think of it as fitness. You can't just achieve 
just then move on and never do any of that again, right? And so it just reinforces that for me and would hopefully allow me to work with friends and colleagues to also help them to understand this if they don't. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's a good point. I like your analogy of it's like fitness. Um, I tell people all the time, if they're struggling to make this a priority, um, you need to reimagine the way you think of this work. If you schedule an hour a week to go to a yoga class or an hour a week to do this, what is stopping you from putting an hour a week on your calendar to specifically go and seek out articles about an identity you don't know or understand well, or read about indigenous populations or um, people who use a wheelchair or whatever it could be, the identity. Um, what's stopping you from doing that and scheduling the time? Because if you don't, it'll always be on the back burner. Uh, so in the interest of time, we're gonna move on, but thank you all. I appreciate that there was not crickets. Okay, so a lot of this, I will own that there's a lot of different experience levels in the room around this material. So for some of you, this is like snooze fest and you already know this, but for some of you, it may not be. So I think it's important that we cover it. So uh, can we process a few things first before we get too deep? So when I say historically marginalized identity, I'm talking about any identity that hasn't been centered or privileged in mainstream cultural, social, um, political, or economic systems. Um, and I also wanna point out a very important definition here that has been whitewashed, um, intersectionality. So ugh, this gets me so amped up. So intersectionality has become like a buzzword in our field where people use intersectionality to mean like people have lots of identities or there are a lot of different things at once. Like, excuse my language, but like no shit. Like we all have different identities. Like we know that we are a lot of different things all at once. Like, yes, great. That's not what black feminism meant when they came up with this term. Um, so it was meant to explain the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination combine, overlap, or intersect, um, such as a person experiencing racism, sexism, and classism all at once. So it's all about compounding oppression. Um, so for example, a black woman is gonna experience discrimination in a different way than a black man or a white woman. And it's that compounded experience of oppression that is where the theory of intersectionality came from, from Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, so I think it's important to go over that because this term has been like really like whitewashed and simplified. Um, any questions about this before we move on? Okie dokie. All right, so privilege. We're gonna talk about privilege and power very quickly before we move on. So privilege has become like a dirty word and people get super sensitive about it. It's not a bad word. It is not a bad thing. It is a gift. Um, so privilege is a set of automatic benefits given to people who fit into a specific social or identity group. It's not to say that you don't have hardships. We all have a variety of hardships regardless of our identities or because of our identities. The point of privilege is that your specific identity is not contributing to that hardship, right? So if you have privilege, it's like a little bit of a head start because you don't have that barrier there. Um, so that's all it means. It's not a dirty word. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's all about and how you use your privilege, which brings us to power. If you have privilege, it gives you power. And that can look like a whole lot of different things. It's access to resources, all sorts of resources, uh, money, people, space, um, a voice at the table, and the ability to influence. So people respecting you, taking you seriously, listening to you, all of those things. Um, and I like to use the Uncle Ben quote here from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So this is where privilege is a gift, right? So if you have that privilege and you have the power, you need to use that because you are now responsible for leveraging it. So I always say like privilege is nothing to feel guilty about. However, if you're not using it, maybe you should feel a little guilty because we have work to do to level the playing field. Um, it's pretty bad out there and we need to make it better. So dang, Amanda, what the heck am I supposed to do about all this nonsense now that I just uh, you know, made it all gloom and doom for y'all? So there are some things we should and should not do. So on the left, we have our yes, please. And on the right, we have our sheesh, that's a yikes, don't do that. So we're gonna go through each one. This is like the meat of the presentation. So if you wanna like screenshot this, cause we'll be going into breakout rooms after this slide. I think it's after this slide. Um, we'll be going to breakout rooms and I'll want you to refer to this slide. So if you wanna like take a picture on your phone or screenshot it, that way you're not 
I don't have to like figure out how to put it into the breakout room. <laughs> um, but yes, please. So some things we need to talk about. So listening and self-work, I think we covered that thoroughly in the previous slides. So making sure that you are taking people seriously and listening. I think the biggest thing with listening is that if someone tells you, so if someone from a marginalized group tells you that what you said or did is offensive to their identity, then it was, period. That is not for you to decide, that is not for you to defend, that is not for you to not believe, it was. If they say it was, then it was. Listen, accept it, apologize, and do better, period. Um, get your people, I like this one. Does anyone know what this means when I'm talking about this? I can, I can answer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like when you see someone that you know or one of your friends or whoever say something that is offensive um, explaining to them what they did is offensive so that people who are marginalized don't have to keep doing all the work yes Samantha exactly so don't let it fall on people from the identity that's underrepresented to constantly be advocating and defending and doing the work you need to get your people especially if they share an identity with you. For example, like as a white person, I know that I need to at times get my people and tell other white people when they're being racist. And that's my responsibility. Um, three, pass the microphone. So this is one we forget a lot, especially I think in our work, we get really proud of ourselves and we pat, pat ourselves on the back for being woke. And we're so busy doing the thing and advocating and being this ally that we forget to pull people in. We forget to lift people up. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of taking your power or your position and your leadership and giving it to people whose voices have been ignored or marginalized or not taking it seriously and lifting them up and helping them be taken seriously. So that's super important in our work. Um, the next, next one, I love this one. So know when something doesn't belong to you. It's not yours. Get. Uh, we do this a lot. I think um, for me as a white person that can be hard um, because a lot of times whitewashing things come into popular culture, whether it's a word, a phrase, a hairstyle. Um, we think about things like appropriation. All of these things come into play here when I'm talking about this, but it could also be less tangible and more amorphous in being like a space or a place. So not just like a hairstyle or a tangible thing, but know when something doesn't belong to you. For example, if there's like a support group or an affinity group or something like that for, um, like for example, our affinity groups for Makuho, like Professionals of Color, Mental Health Alliance, if you don't hold that identity, that space is not for you, get out. Um, those spaces exist so that people can share and process and just exist in a space without fear of experiencing the racism or homophobia or discrimination that they've experienced for so long. And that is the space where they can just breathe and be themselves and not have to worry about you trying to learn from them for the 15,000th time. No, like sessions like this is where you take yourself to learn. Support spaces are not for you. So know when something doesn't belong to you and respect that. And lastly, take the risk. Silence really is violence. Um, the time has been long done for sitting by and not saying or doing something or being afraid to offend people. Like we need to fix things. Things need to get better and it won't get better if we aren't all challenging ourselves and doing the really, really hard things. I'm sure every one of us, myself especially, can think of a time where we didn't say something. And whether it was not on purpose or we were just so uh, flabbergasted or surprised or shocked or scared or didn't know what to say, with that has to stop. We have to do better. Um, we have to learn from that and work on that. And if we don't, things aren't going to change. On the right here, which a lot of these relate to the things on the left, uh, but these are things that a lot of times we see from people who call themselves an ally. Uh, so one, performative allyship. Uh, I know some of the other sessions talked about performative allyship as well. It's those super visible things. Um, so performative allyship looks like only doing the things that are easy for you to do as an ally or only doing it when people are watching or only sharing things on social media, but not calling out the racist uncle. Um, so doing all of those things that make you look good. Um, and are you just doing these things at a conference? Are you just doing these things in the workplace? Are you doing it also in the supermarket or with your family or at a social gathering with friends? 
Um, it needs to really be something you live out and just don't do for people that you know are gonna react well. Savior complex. Um, this is a huge issue. Uh, so savior complex is when you come in basically as the ally thinking that you're like a messiah and you're gonna fix and solve everything. It's like the opposite of pass the microphone. So you think that you know what's wrong and these poor people, you're gonna help them and come in and make things better and you're gonna be the hero. Um, and that takes away a lot of the power that is needed. And it's also, even if this was in theory, something that would work, it's not, um, what's the word? It's not the long game because you're not gonna be able to be there forever, right? Like you're gonna leave at some point. Um, so we need to give resources. We need to exchange power um, because the savior complex is not gonna work. One example of this that can be a little controversial, um, and I know that there are good things that happen on these trips, um, but a good example of savior complex that I've seen are mission trips um, can sometimes be problematic in this way. Um, I'm, if you've been on a mission trip, I'm not trying to insult you, but rather have you critically examine maybe how the funds raised for that trip could have been dispersed in a more um, inclusive way to give resources and power back into the community. Um, as opposed to sometimes for people, those trips, it's like a great opportunity to take a picture and show that you made a difference and go on this like vacation, basically. Like, yes, you're working, you helped build a school, that's great. But in 10 years, when that school starts to deteriorate, like who's gonna be there equipped with the schools and not with the tools and knowledge to help rebuild that and keep the community thriving. Um, so we need to invest back in our communities is my example with that one. Living in your comfort zone. So that's the the um, foil to the last bullet on the left side. So as, you, as opposed to taking the risk, a lot of times we're just living in our comfort zone, right? You're not saying anything if you know that person is gonna be a problem. Like how many times do you have that person? Do y'all have that person in your life, whether it's a family member or someone that you know as soon as you say something or post something, they're gonna come at you? Do it anyway, <laughs> do it anyway. Um, so just don't live in that comfort zone or things aren't going to get better. Defensiveness. This is huge. We have such a problem with being corrected. Um, like I said, if someone tells you from a marginalized identity that they were offended by what you said or what you said was problematic, then you better believe them. Accept it and apologize and tell them how you will do better. Don't tell them why you did it. Don't tell them what you meant. Don't tell them what your intention was. Tell them how you will do better. And then if you need to f further understand that, or if it's still confusing to you, get out the old Google machine and do your own homework. Um, Cause oftentimes we're like, wait, I don't get it. Can you help me understand? And then maybe if you have like a really close reciprocal relationship with that person, that's a conversation you can have. Um, otherwise maybe just use the internet and don't make them put out that labor for you for the like 15th time of the week, trying to educate yet another person on their identity. Tone policing. Um, this is one that I think we see a lot in the workplace. Um, workplaces are notorious for tone policing um, because we're all about professionalism and like don't curse and don't raise your voice and all these things. Um, but my problem is when we're so focused on tone policing that we're more focused on how they're saying it than what they're saying or why they're saying it. Um, so if someone, you know, if you offend someone and they get loud with you or something like that, they have a reason to feel pain. Their pain is valid and that's being expressed through their tone. And like, I don't see a problem with that. <laughs> we shouldn't see a problem with that. Um, focus on what they're saying and the message. And that should really be what you care more about rather than their tone. Um, your feelings should be inconsequential here when it comes to learning and doing better and not practicing racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera. And the last one, which most of us, I hope, would know at this point in the game, this is more something that we hear like growing up in elementary school is a yikes of erasing or not seeing difference. So you see that a lot with people saying they're colorblind or we're all the same or we're all people. Um, kind of what um, we were saying earlier, Suzanne, about like tolerance, like, no, this is not, that's not the goal here, right? We wanna see different identities. We wanna uplift, we wanna celebrate identities. Another example I can think of, like, for example, when I came out, um, one of my family members was like, I still love you, or I love you anyway, or I'll always love you. And I was like, I know you're trying to be nice right now, but what I'm hearing you say is that in spite of this thing that is yuck, <laughs> that you still love me. So it's like an identity to get past or not see it. Um, so that can be super hurtful. And like, that was probably like 
I don't know, seven years ago, and I still remember that moment. So you can see how those things stick with you. So now that I dumped all of that on you, are there any questions about these or anything that people want to add? If not, totally okay. I just don't want to blow past it because that was a lot. Your story about like sharing when you came out just reminds me of like when, um, like when people come out and then friends or family members be like, oh, honey, I know, I knew. Uh, like really, because I just came to terms with this and I'm the one that's my body and my things. And so it's funny that you knew, like, <laughs> it's like yeah. trying to convince the other person that you know more about who they are and the identities that they hold more than they do. Yeah, and another thing that's problematic with that, it's like making it about them, about themselves or their identity. Like, <laughs> this isn't about you. Like, don't try to show me how smart you are, Karen, like chill. Like, I'm trying to have a moment here and I came to this on my own. And until I say I'm something, I'm not something. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's a good point. Anybody else? Okay, all right, so we're gonna move on. So we don't have a whole lot of time left, um, but I do want to um, put you in breakout rooms. Let me see. And now it's there, yeah? It is there. Yay, we like Perfect. it. Okay, is everyone back? I think so. Looks like about the right number for participants. Okay, um, so I think we would normally have time to debrief and share a little bit about what people said, but we don't have time. So I hope you learned something. Okay, so to wrap up, I want you all to, in whatever way works for you, um, make yourself a visual reminder. So thank you for being honest with yourself and each other. Now you can do better because you've talked about the mistakes you've made. Um, maybe you learned a little bit. So I want you to literally, if you have pen and paper and you can hang this up somewhere, great. If not, if you want to write it on your phone and like take a screenshot and make it like your lock screen or your home screen or something, whatever you need to do, to write this down somewhere and look at it every day or once a week at least, right? Put it in your planner so you open up and see it. Write your commitment. So use the last, how much time do we have left, Samantha? Like three minutes? I think like three minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So use the last three minutes because then we can share for the last two minutes or something. Um, write your statement. So I used to think blank, but then I learned blank. Now I commit to doing blank by leveraging the power from my blank privilege. So for some people, they've said it's easier to start backwards here and think about your privilege and then maybe work on what you're learning and committing to doing. So take a few minutes, um, just work independently. And then if one or two people want to share back their um, commitment statement, that would be great. Go team. Okay, so is anyone able to complete this with my completely unrealistic time expectation? Oh, Alex, go for it. Allie, too. We'll have you both share quick. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I used to think I was doing the right thing, and I was right, but then I learned to listen to others, and now I commit to doing the work myself to improve by leveraging the power from my everything privilege. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Alex, snaps. I like that. That's different than ones that I've heard because it's just saying, like, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm learning. I'm flawed. And it's very, Always. like, so Always room to improve. Yeah, thanks, Alec. All right, Allie. Um, I used to think that I was not a racist, but then I learned about complicity in racist structures. Now I commit to doing uh, the education of others by leveraging the power from my white privilege. Yes, complicity. Good job, Allie, that's great. Um, so I hope if you didn't get to finish your statement that you can take five more minutes at some point today to finish your statement. And again, I'm not kidding, put it somewhere visible. Remind yourself of what you need to keep doing or start doing. And with that, I'm just gonna close out and ask if anybody has any questions.